Hello again, everyone, and we're now ready to proceed with our first part of gravimetric analysis procedure. First, I'd like to tell you about the chemicals we will be using today. First, what we have here is 3-molar hydrochloric acid, HCl. Like I explained earlier, we're going to use this uh, substance to help us dissolve our carbonation compound. In this container here, I have barium chloride. It's 0.25 molar uh, barium chloride solution, which will be used to precipitate our sulfate as barium sulfate. So this is our source of barium ions. And then there are two other chemicals that will be employed later in the procedure, but I wanted to talk about them uh, briefly now. This right here is 1% ammonium nitrate solution, NH4NO3. This is what we're going to use later to wash our barium sulfate precipitate with. And finally, this right here in the small brown bottle is a um, substance that may be familiar to you from before we used it before in lab. This is silver nitrate. Silver nitrate will be used to test for any chloride ions present in our precipitate. But I will come back to this as um, I discuss the second portion of this procedure in the later video. So right now we're going to jump right in into the procedure. Right here in this uh, 250 milliliter beaker, I pre-weighed um, close to 1.5 grams of substance and uh, I will put the actual mass in the notes um, to this video. So this right here is our uh, tetramine copper sulfate monohydrate, the purple compound that we're analyzing for mass percent of sulfate. We're going to first add about 100 milliliters of water, just like your procedure suggests. Uh, I'm hoping you have your lab manual maybe nearby as you're watching this so you can match what I'm doing with what your procedure directions are. So uh, roughly 100 milliliters of water into here. Not surprising, it creates this uh, bright purple uh, solution. I'm going to use a stirring rod to stir it up to help me dissolve it. And in this uh, small graduated cylinder here, um, you see that in your procedure, you recommended to add 10 milliliters of three molar hydrochloric acid, which is what I have here. Uh, what do you think will happen as I add the HCl to my purple solution? Correct, we were going to see color change. Remember when we add HCl, ammonia, which is basic, is going to be neutralized by the acid and the color should change from purple to light blue. Let's see if we can make this happen. As you hopefully can see, we did get a color change. We now have a light blue solution, which contains copper ions, because uh, the copper ions are now surrounded by water molecules rather than ammonia molecules. The color has changed from purple to light blue. So I'm going to stir it up. I'm going to make sure there is no solid remaining. As you hope, can hopefully see, the solution is absolutely clear. I'd like to remind you that clear does not necessarily mean colorless. In this case, solution is colored. It's light blue, but it's clear, meaning we are able to see through it. Uh, and that means the solid has dissolved completely. We are now going to set our beaker on the heating mantle. As you can see, I have a ring stand, ring holder, wire mesh, and the beaker is going to sit on the top here. And uh, we're going to light the burner, which hopefully you remember uh, how to do. I lit the burner and I'm going to adjust it. I'm going to uh, make sure my flame is as hot as possible, which means I need to open the uh, slits allowing air in. Now I have a blue flame with an inner cone, which is what I want because it's the hottest part of hottest flame possible. Uh, the tip of the inner cone um, is the hottest part of the flame. And so when I position the burner under the heat, my, under my ring stand, I should be able to see the tip of the inner cone touching, just touching the um, bottom of the beaker. 
So I think um, my burner is adjusted properly. I have a very good height of the flame and proper color so I can position the, the burner under the heating mantle, uh, under my setup, I should say, and we're going to let it heat. What we want to happen is for our solution to heat until it's either almost boiling or uh, gently boiling. We don't want it to boil crazily, we don't want it to jump out of the beaker, we just want it to be very, very hot. While the solution is heating, I'd like to explain why we're heating it. Uh, the next step in the procedure, of course, is to add our barium chloride. I have uh, 30 milliliters of it measured here in this graduated cylinder. Again, just uh, like your procedure recommends, but I don't want to add it until the solution is hot. And um, I will also be adding it drop-wise. I have a pasta pipette right here that I prepared, and I'm going to be adding um, barium chloride to my solution once it gets hot enough. And the reason for uh, the requirement that solution is hot and for adding barium chloride drop by drop is because I want my particles of the precipitate to be as large as possible. Because the next step of the procedure, which we'll, uh, we'll address in our next week's video, will be to filter uh, barium sulfate and filter it in such a way where we can collect as much precipitate as possible so that we can later determine its accurate mass. Because remember, our um, calculation of sulfate content in the purple compound depends on how accurately we can measure, uh, collect and measure mass of barium sulfate. As you can see, my solution is getting pretty hot. I can tell it's pretty close to uh, starting to boil. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes. And as soon as I see that it's uh, starting to boil, I will probably turn down the gas and I may set the burner aside for a while if I notice that it's getting too hot. I don't want, like I said before, for it to boil uh, too strongly. So I'm going to set it aside and uh, start adding my barium chloride. And then if I notice that it's not boiling and it's getting maybe not as hot as I want it to be, I can always put my burner back. Notice that I don't even have to um, uh, turn off the burner. I can just set it aside and then slide it um, back right under my setup if I um, feel like I need to heat some more. My solution is now fairly hot. I can tell it's um, just about to start boiling. So I'm going to uh, give it another minute or so. You'll notice I'm not using um, a watch glass that's recommended in your procedure. I'm basically just doing it to save time. Uh, watch glass uh, would be advisable in case if you're worried that your solution might overboil. I'm fairly confident in my lab skills, so I hope I won't let it happen. So um, I'm not using watch glass. If you were doing it, I would probably still suggest you had a watch glass right here above um, your solution covering the rim of the beaker just to prevent any particles of barium sulfate uh, from escaping but I'm hoping I can manage without so my solution is um, very hot now I can tell it's starting to boil so I'm going to turn down the heat remember to uh, reduce the size of the flame we're using the valve on the bottom of the burner so I'm going to uh, screw in the valve to make sure I have a smaller size of the flame I'm still going to keep the burner underneath my beaker for now but making the flame smaller will help me uh, control the uh, heating I'm doing and I'm going to go ahead and start adding barium chloride what do you think will happen when I uh, start introducing barium chloride right in the solution we have sulfate ions Right in this pipette, I have my barium ions, like I showed you in that equation, um, that ionic equation of the reaction. Barium ions are going to pair up with sulfate ions, and they're going to create white precipitate of barium sulfate. So my solution is going to stop looking so clear, 
you will notice it will become milky white and with time white precipitate will start collecting on the bottom. So as you can see barium uh, sulfate is starting to form so my solution just like I thought it would uh, is turning cloudy so I'm uh, creating barium sulfate So this is exactly what you uh, would have been doing if we didn't uh, have this uh, crazy situation that uh, is affecting everyone in this country and probably in the world. And so we have to resort to this. And I'm hoping um, you're learning as I'm doing this and you're understanding what uh, it is I'm doing and what I'm trying to achieve. You'll notice I am adding barium chloride dropwise, but I'm not really doing like tiny drop at a time. I'm adding a steady stream of drops to my solution. I'm going to go ahead and increase the flame a little bit because remember I want my solution to be either boiling or gently boiling. And uh, since I sort of scale down the flame and stop exhibiting any signs of boiling so I'm gonna heat it up a little bit more before I add any more of my barium chloride. I have to be careful though because um, the particles of the precipitate um, start sort of jumping around. You can tell the solution is kind of moving around right now. So as we speak, I, I'm decreasing the size of the flame to avoid it boiling over. And I may in fact just slide the burner out for a moment like I told you I would. And I now keep, uh, now keep adding my barium chloride. See, this is very important to control the heating because if you happen to overheat, you are uh, risking a situation where um, the solution might boil over, which of course will be very dangerous. At the same time, um, you want to keep the solution hot, so the best compromise right now is to um, decrease the size of the flame again by screwing in the valve is not cooperating at the moment, but we'll get it to work. There. So I have a smaller flame, and I'm going to put the burner right under the beaker again. I'm going to wait until the solution is starting to get hot again. It's a good idea to sometimes go like this to ensure the entire outer surface gets heated evenly. I'm not sure if you can see, we will uh, zoom to this later so you can see the white precipitate starting to collect on the bottom of the beaker that's my barium sulfate so it's exactly what I was hoping for and that's what I am um, trying to accomplish here So I'm about halfway through adding my barium sulfate, I'm sorry, barium chloride. You can see these white plumes of the precipitate kind of jumping around. So when I see this happen, what do I do? I slide the burner right out. And then I can safely add some more. And once I'm done adding, I can put the burner back under there and heat the solution again. I 
and again notice I'm only adding one drop at a time this is stages stream of drops but it is still a uh, drop wise addition and again I cannot just pour in all the barium chloride in, into this beaker at, um, at one time uh, the reaction would still of course happen and I would still get my barium sulfate however uh, the concern might be and would be is that if I add barium chloride too quickly and too much of it at a time, I'm going to end up with a situation where my precipitate um, particles are so tiny that when I try to filter um, my precipitate and try to collect as much barium sulfate as I possibly can, some of that precipitate will go through filter paper. You might think, how can a precipitate go through filter paper? Yet, it is uh, entirely possible, and I've seen it happen many times before. Um, again, it all depends on the size of the particles of the precipitate, which I'm trying to make as big as possible right now. That's why I'm heating, and that's why I'm adding my barium chloride so slowly. Um, the filter paper contains tiny channels, and uh, if particles of the precipitate are small enough, they will go right through. So you can see the precipitate. I'm gonna agitate it a little bit by stirring it. It kind of looks like a sky with clouds on it. With light blue color with white clouds. So I'm waiting for my uh, solution to reheat a little bit and then I'm gonna finish adding my barium chloride and we're going to stop uh, for today. This is the procedure, like I said, that um, you would be doing. This week. But because you cannot. I thought I'd show you in detail what exactly you would be doing. slide the burner out once more time one more time again to control the jumping of the precipitate in my beaker which could potentially be unsafe remember we're adding a large excess of barium chloride so you may notice that right now despite the fact that I keep adding barium chloride does not seem to be producing <coughs> excuse me does not seem to be producing much of the precipitate this is probably because at this point all the sulfate ions that I started with have already uh, formed the barium sulfate but I want to make sure all the sulfate is converted so I am uh, adding excess of barium chloride in other words, more than I need to complete the reaction. The goal again here is to ensure that all the sulfate that I got from my purple carnation compound is now present in this beaker in the form of the precipitate barium sulfate, which we will subsequently filter. And after we filter it, I'm going to show you how you might be able to get rid of the filter paper by burning it off. Uh, by placing the precipitate in the filter paper in the crucible and heating the crucible strongly. There is a lot of heating in this experiment, that's for sure. So I'm almost done adding. And as soon as I'm done adding, um, I'm going to uh, stop recording and um, I'm going to um, Note that the notes that I showed you when I was doing the pre-lab introduction will be posted on Canvas. 
Remember, look under modules and find the module titled Synthesis and Analysis of Coordination Compound. All the videos pertaining to this experiment will also be found under the same module on Canvas. While we have a couple of minutes, I'd like to remind you that um, the pre-lab for uh, this portion of the experiment, it's pre-lab three, as well as um, data sheet two with the graph and calculations on mass percent copper completed should be emailed to your TAs so that um, they can start grading your work. I am getting quite a few questions about the format. Um, ideally, you would scan your um, pre-lab and your data sheet and get a PDF file and attach it to the email to your TA. If you cannot do that, please take a picture with your phone, but make sure it's um, done in high resolution mode so TAs can actually see what is on the picture and are able to print it for grading. Trying to jump again. Here okay, we will do this. I don't want to stop heating completely because again I'm worried for the solution not being hot enough and particles not being large enough. So I'm trying to kind of compromise here by decreasing the size of the flame. You can hopefully see the flame is now uh, very small. So this helps me uh, make sure no overboiling will occur while still keeping the solution as hot as possible. So it looks like I am now done. This is my last pipette full of barium chloride. I hope you can see the white precipitate that has collected in the bottom of my beaker. So that's my barium sulfate. I'm going to let it heat for several more minutes and then I'm going to uh, turn off the burner. I'm going to take the beaker off the heating mantle um, like you would with a hot mitt to keep my hands safe from touching the hot beaker. I'm going to let the beaker cool completely to room temperature and then I'm going to filter barium sulfate but we will discuss filtering in our next video. So until uh, our next meeting in the virtual, virtual world um, Bye-bye, everyone, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.